privilege to be here at the University of Toronto. I thank the Tannenbaum and Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, Anna, and all of my new colleagues here. I'm very grateful to the Gerstein family for making this distinguished teaching position possible. Um, it's been very exciting for me. I decided when I came that I would make up a whole new course, which maybe um, other academics will say, is she crazy or what? But um, in fact, it's been very stimulating to do reading, lots of new research, and lots of PowerPoint presentations um, to share with the students who are a very, very interesting and diverse uh, group. So um, I'll get right to the talk. Um, Jewish social historians have noted the high degree of marital instability and divorce in the various centers of medieval Jewish settlement, including the Muslim world, Spain, and Ashkenaz, as Jews referred to their communities in northern France and German-speaking Europe. In his indispensable study of the world of the Cairo Geniza, S. D. Goitan commented on this phenomenon, suggesting that not only did the larger Muslim society accept divorce as a commonplace occurrence, but also that arranged marriages, significant geographical mobility, and quote, the greater attentiveness to a wife's sufferings to be expected in a cosmopolitan bourgeois society contributed to the frequent dissolution of marriages. Divorced women of means, he noted, particularly if they had desired the divorce and had support from well-connected family members, were able to remarry without difficulty. Avraham Grossman, in his study of medieval Jewish women, also observed that divorce was very common in most locales in the Middle Ages, writing that the family unit in most Jewish communities was not at all stable, and that the idyllic descriptions found in a number of studies have no basis in fact. Moreover, the willingness of medieval Jewish women to be divorced indicates that social attitudes towards divorcees were not negative, Apparently, there were plentiful opportunities for remarriage, and women's strong economic status in Ashkenaz gave those women who desired it the freedom to determine their own futures. Yet, given the reality that executing a halakhic divorce is a, uni is a unilateral act limited to the husband, it seems surprising that significant numbers of medieval Jewish women appear to have been able to initiate and obtain divorces, apparently as a matter of course. At least part of the answer is to be found in a takana of the Gaonic period, often called the takana of the Moredet, or rebellious wife. Yes. Yeah, both sides. <laughs> a takana is a revision in rabbinic law advanced by a recognized legal authority in response to a present social need. This particular takana or edict was instituted in the mid 7th century in Baghdad, mid 7th century of the common era, of course, in response to the actions of Jewish women who appealed to Muslim courts to obtain coerced divorces from recalcitrant husbands when their claims were not sympathetically received in rabbinic tribunals. Moreover, some unhappy wives also converted to Islam, an act that automatically annulled their Jewish marriages. The takana of the Moredit was intended to give such women an alternative to acting outside the rabbinic judicial process. It was a pragmatic measure on the part of the Ga'onim, the rabbinic leaders of the time, that allowed women to achieve their purpose 
while maintaining communal respect for Jewish courts and assuring that the get, the divorce document, was, uh, was formulated according to rabbinic law. Essentially, the Takana of the Moredit stated that if a woman claimed in a Jewish court, in a Beit Din, that she could not bear to live with her husband, the husband would be compelled to grant her an immediate divorce on the condition that she relinquish most or all of what was ordinarily owed her when the marriage ended by death or divorce, as stated in her ketubah, her marriage contract. While the primary motivation for this takana was the immediate need to prevent women from circumventing and undermining Jewish legal institutions, the ability of the Beit Din, the court, to coerce divorce had precedence in Talmudic legislation in several specific sets of circumstances. One of these appears in Mishnah Kitubot 710 and its elaborations in the Babylonian Talmud Kitubot 77a. This is the ruling that a court can compel a husband to divorce his wife, presumably with her full ketubah rights, if she claims that she finds it abhorrent to cohabit with him. The text reads, and these are the men whom we force to divorce their wives at her request. A man smitten with boils, a man who has ineradicable bad breath, a gatherer of handfuls of excrement, a refiner of copper, and a tanner, professions which uh, led to bad smells. Um, an additional justification for a forced divorce at the woman's verbal request appears in the Babylonian Talmud at Yebamot 65b uh, in several anecdotes about wives in infertile marriages who petitioned for divorce so that they might have the possibility of offspring with another husband. These requests are granted not because the woman is halachically obligated to procreate, since she is not, but because her fears of an impoverished widowhood and old age without the support of offspring are persuasive. Another precedent for a woman precipitating a divorce is discussed in Mishnah Kitubot 7.5 and Babylonian Talmud Kitubot 63a to 64b. This is the case of the wife who refuses sexual relations with her husband, or indeed who refuses to fulfill any of the household duties incumbent upon her. She is considered a moredet, a rebellious wife, and she is subject to a daily monetary fine. If her rebellion persists for 12 months, or to the point when the value of her marriage portion, her ketubah is exhausted, her husband is compelled by a Jewish court to divorce her. At the same time, he is released from the obligation to return the additional payments to which a divorced wife was ordinarily entitled. We should note that a husband may also refuse sexual relations with his wife as a mored, a rebel. He too is subject to daily fines, although at half the rate charged the rebellious wife. The reason given for this difference is that he suffers more than she does from sexual deprivation. Okay. Um, The right of a Jewish woman to initiate divorce proceedings was not as revolutionary as it may appear. The Cairo, in addition to the rabbinic uh, citations, the Cairo Geniza documents include kitubot, marriage contracts, written according to what is called the custom of the land of Israel. These marriage contracts define marriage as a partnership um, and, and these documents state that a wife may 
initiate divorce proceedings against her husband if she finds herself unable to live with him. Um, this alternate marriage contract may have provided the Ge'onim with an additional legal model for wife-initiated divorce beyond the perceived need to respond to a social reality of unhappy wives resorting to Gentile courts. It's important to emphasize that in both the Ge'onic Takana and the partnership marriage of the Land of Israel, the actual divorce must follow rabbinic practice in that it is only formalized when the husband transmits a get, a bill of divorce, to his former wife. Near the end of the 10th century, Rav Shirira Gaon, who died in 1007, writes in response to a legal query from North Africa that the Takana of the Moredet continued in effect in Babylonia and should be followed elsewhere in the Jewish world. Babylonia is um, how Jews refer to basically Iraq and Iran. Um, so he reaffirms that the Takana, again first formulated in the mid uh, seventh century, continues in effect uh, throughout the Jewish world. And 11th century sources report that the ruling was accepted in Ashkenaz, the Jewish community in Northern Europe, out of respect for the Babylonian Ge'onim, the Babylonian rabbinic leadership. Sources indicate that following the ruling by Rav Sharira Ga'on, the Takana of the Moredet was observed by Jewish societies in both the Muslim and Christian worlds for nearly 500 years. Although no uniform practices regarding ketubah payments were established. Um, that is, there would often be court negotiations as to how much, if any, of the ketubah portion the woman received back, uh, probably depending on the power of her family members and her importance in the community, she would get more. In some cases, she um, might receive nothing. In any event, this ordinance gave great power to Jewish women. Over time, however, a woman's engineering of a divorce by claiming more Reddit status increasingly lost rabbinic support. And I'll talk about that uh, this afternoon. First in Ashkenaz and then in Spain, likely due to the influence of Ashkenazic legal authorities who immigrated there in the 14th century and ultimately in the Muslim world. By the 16th century, this takana, allowing divorce on a woman's claim that her husband was repugnant to her, that I can't stand him, uh, was no longer honored anywhere, and it is not mentioned in the definitive legal code, the Shulchan Aruch, compiled by Joseph Caro and published in 1563, or its commentaries. In the remainder of my remarks today, I will focus first on the operation of this takana in the Muslim world, then move on to Ashkenaz, where an alternative approach for women seeking to initiate divorce dominated. And I will conclude with the ultimate disappearance of this Gaonic takana from Jewish legal practice. So to the Muslim world, where all of this originated. Rabbinic authorities in the Muslim world followed the Ge'onic Takana of the Moredet, requiring the court to compel a husband to divorce his wife if she insisted that he was abhorrent to her with the proviso that she suffered a financial loss. It is evident from many documents found in the Cairo Geniza that such divorces became a standard practice for women wishing to extricate themselves from uncongenial unions. It is also the case that making use of this takana was only possible for a woman who had independent means or influential family members prepared to act on her behalf. As Goitan has observed, strong women, strong in character and strong through their family, connections and possessions, 
no doubt often had the upper hand in their quest for divorce. But a woman without ample personal finances or a supportive family would almost certainly not have risked the multiple dangers of life on her own without a husband, no matter how miserable her marital situation might be. The Takana of the Moredet closely follows Muslim practice. In fact, the Geniza texts and contemporary sources use an Islamic legal term, an Arabic legal term for this procedure, iftida, ransoming herself. That is a woman's freeing herself by monetary sacrifice, an option that is stated in the Quran. So the Takana, which was formulated to discourage women and their families from acting outside Jewish institutions, can be understood as an example of Jewish accommodation to the larger culture through an expression of the norms of the majority in a Jewish legal context. Moses Maimonides, who spent most of his adult life in Cairo, expressed his support of the Takana of the Moredet in his legal code, the Mishneh Torah. Um, yeah, down at the bottom, Ishut 14.8. Uh, Here he combined the two Talmudic rationales for wife-initiated divorce, a wife's expression of repugnance towards her husband and her rebellion against intimate relations um, with him um, in justifying his support of the edict. In other words, both of the reasons given in Tractate Kitubot. And he wrote, the wife who prevents her husband from having intercourse with her is called a rebellious wife and should be questioned as to the reason for her rebelliousness. rebelliousness. If she says, I have come to loathe him and I cannot willingly submit to his intercourse, he must be compelled to divorce her immediately, for she is not like a captive woman who must submit to a man who is hateful to her. An example of the Takana of the Moredet in practice is found in Maimonides' response to literature in a series of legal questions to Maimonides and his, and his answers. Responsa is the extensive literature extending to the present, the present where individuals or communities write to a rabbinic authority with a problem that their own authorities cannot answer and the authority writes back a response. And later on, in the case certainly of major rabbinic authorities, the responsa are published um, and preserved as precedents for future uh, similar situations. In any case, the letters to Maimonides uh, are from both a husband and a wife. That is, he received one letter from the husband, one letter from the wife, um, and in 12th century Cairo. The letters recount how a deserted wife made herself independent by running a school a kind of primary school for little boys, assisted first by her brother and then by her elder son. Interesting just in and of itself in showing that women, some women were educated enough professionally to in fact uh, run a primary school to be able to teach uh, small boys. Um, years later, her husband reappeared after having been absent for at least a decade, if not more. And he demanded that she give up the school because it injured his dignity for his wife to be a teacher. Otherwise, he asked Maimonides for permission to take a second wife to tend to his needs at home. Um, yes, we know that Jews in the Muslim world often did have more than one wife. But we also know that written intermarriage contracts very often, especially of prosperous women, were clauses 
preventing the husband from taking a second wife. In this case, he must have agreed to a contract that forbade him taking a second wife, but now he wants that clause um, eliminated. Yes, uh, the wife in turn argued that her husband had been repeatedly undependable and that she had built up her student clientele and would not be able to resume her school easily should her husband again disappear. Maimonides advised the wife to refuse all intimate relations with her husband and to forfeit her marriage portion. Her refusal to have intercourse with her husband would constitute grounds for divorce since she would be considered omoretic. His failure to support her, as promised in her marriage contract, her kudubah, would also strengthen her case. After that, Maimonides wrote, she will have disposition over herself. She may teach what she likes and do what she likes. But if she remains with her husband, he could forbid her to teach. We don't know how it came out, but I think we um, can guess which direction she chose. Maimonides invoked the Takana of the Moredet to inform the woman of an exit strategy. If she declared that her husband was repulsive to her and if she refrained from, social, I'm sorry, from sexual relations, then the court would coerce him to divorce her. She, on the other hand, would lose her dowry and the portion of the groom's bridal payment that was to be returned to her in case of her husband's death or the dissolution of the marriage. Given the many years she had lived as a deserted wife, the fact that she had a successful business with her son and the likelihood that her bridal dowry had been lost by her feckless husband long ago, it's hard to imagine she would not have grasped this opportunity. This case documents how the Takana of the Moredet functioned in the Geniza world by providing a sensible way for a woman to dissolve an untenable marriage. This process must have been utilized time and again in cases where the wife was willing to relinquish what was due her financially and in those where there were no longer remaining resources to be withheld. Okay. Uh, I turn now to Ashkenaz, and yes, we have a little map up there showing uh, the area we're talking about, the area kind of um, on the borders of France and Germany, uh, the center of Jewish life um, in the Middle Ages. Kind of hard to see, but we have the, um, yeah, the cities of, of Worm, Speyer, and Mainz um, up there, uh, which were the three major centers of Jewish rabbinic authority, as well as many other locations marked that had Jewish communities. Okay, so while divorce was commonplace among the majority culture in the Muslim world, this was not the case in Ashkenaz, where Christianity saw marriage as a sacrament, a holy act, and prohibited divorce almost entirely. So one reason the Takanav the Moredit was so um, able to be put into practice in the Muslim world was divorce was already permitted. It was not in any way um, standing out from the majority culture. Um, but in the Christian world where divorce was pretty much forbidden, unhappy Jewish wives could not turn to Gentile courts to dissolve their marriages as they had done in Muslim locales. This cultural discrepancy affected the reception and enforcement of the Takana of the Moredit among Ashkenazic rabbinic leaders and ultimately facilitated its elimination across the Jewish world. Between the 10th and the 14th centuries, many Jewish women in Ashkenaz had high status in their families and communities. Women in the Christian world had much more freedom of movement than women in general in the Muslim world, and that went for Jewish women. Women were active participants in the family economy. 
the large dowry a wife typically brought into her marriage assured her a prominent position in her household. Women were often partners with their husbands in economic endeavors, and wives ran their family's affairs when their husbands were absent on business. Some, including wives of scholars, as well as widows, supported their families entirely in economic endeavors and entrepreneurship, um, including lending money, or perhaps particularly in lending money. Women's high social and economic status, as well as the customs and attitude of the majority Christian culture, are usually cited as the reasons uh, behind the early 11th century Taka note attributed to Rabbi Gershom of Mainz, who lived between approximately 960 and 1040 and is considered the first major rabbinic authority of the Jews of Ashkenaz. Um, so Rabbi Gershom issued a number of Taka note, but perhaps the most interesting from the point of view of gender relations are one which prohibited husbands from divorcing wives against their will, and the second which prohibited polygyny for Ashkenazic Jews. Um, about 19 years ago in the year 2000, there was some discussion of the fact that Rabbi Gershom's Takana was supposed to be a thousand year Takana. And now that a thousand years had passed, would there be a return um, to polygyny in Jewish communities? Well, so far it's not happening, yes. But in any case, these were very important rulings for women in Ashkenaz. Number one, uh, quite contrary to halakhic practice, that the husband had to get his wife's permission to divorce her. And secondly, that a husband could only have one wife um, at a time, unlike um, Jews in the Muslim world. The place of the Takana of the Moredit in Ashkenazic legal thinking and social practice must be understood in this context. As Avraham Grossman has noted, the Takana of the Moredit created an absurd situation in Ashkenaz, very much at odds with Jewish law, with halakha, since it allowed a woman to force her husband to give her a divorce while he could not dissolve their marriage without her permission. Grossman speculates that Rabbi Gershom retained the Takana out of reverence for the Babylonian Ga'onim because of the relative antiquity of the ruling, already almost 500 years old, well, at least 400 years old in his time, and perhaps to give suffering women a way out of unhappy unions as well. However, Grossman goes on to write that the repeated questions raised about this issue in rabbinic writings suggest certain misgivings and uncertainties among, about it among the sages, since it was explicitly opposed to what is implied in the Talmud about the unilateral nature of divorce in Judaism as a male prerogative. In the Muslim world, as we have seen, a woman was required to claim that her husband was repugnant in order for, to her for the bait din to force a divorce. And she did so with the understanding that she was relinquishing all or a portion of her dowry and any other payment specified in the ketubah. However, most of the medieval sages of Ashkenaz refused to accept this claim of repugnance <laughs> as grounds for divorce. They believed it gave a woman too much power that her testimony about loathing her husband might actually be, actually be obscuring her preference for another man, women are untrustworthy, and that endorsing such requests would weaken the family unit and increase the incident of divorce. Already in the 12th century, rabbinic leaders especially Rabbi Jacob ben Meir Tom, known as Rabbeinu Tom, uh, had vehemently attacked the frequency of women initiating divorces by rebelling against their husbands. 
he strongly rejected the Takana of the Moredit, and he questioned the validity of any divorce document that was given under coercive circumstances. According to his thinking, the Geonim did not have the right to make a regulation of this type, that is, forcing a husband to give a get, because in principle such coercion is improper and places in doubt the very validity of the document. He argued as well that this ordinance is not incumbent upon present generations. Thus, claims on the grounds of repugnance were generally not privileged in Ashkenaz, and women instead employed the other Talmudic option for wife-initiated divorce, rebellion by refusing sexual relations. This was most frequently accompanied by a woman's refusal to immerse in the mikvah following her state of nida. In becoming a moredit, she would lose her ketubah over time based on daily fines, and then the court would compel her husband to divorce her. This is the reason for divorce most frequently cited in the halachic literature of the Middle Ages in Ashkenaz. And uh, I just had to share this lovely little manuscript illumination with you um, about the laws of Nida and um, this picture of the wife, the obedient wife, immersing herself as expeditiously as possible in the mikvah while her husband holding a candle um, awaits her in bed. So um, this was the way things were supposed to be. Um, this is um, an illustration. Um, did I put the dates on there? Um, it's from Mainz in the around 1430 or so, uh, from a collection called the Hamburg Miscellany. Okay. <laughs> Yes. All right. However, as I said, the claim on the grounds of repugnance was generally not privileged. Uh, oh, and, and women, yeah, sorry. Um, the off-sided reason that, the off-sided concern that a woman might deliberately refuse to immerse in the mikvah in as expeditious a way as possible following the end of her menstrual period and the end of the white days that followed the actual period reflects the social reality in medieval Jewish communities, which uh, were profoundly concerned with ritual purity. So women's refusal to conform to male needs have been termed mikvah rebellions. <coughs> And one scholar says, in these domestic insurrections, women rebelled against their husbands, refusing to have marital relations with them and forcing divorce. Women in Ashkenaz often achieved economic independence based on money lending to non-Jews, substantial dowries, and inheritances from their parents, which were legally the woman's private property. If a woman was not economically dependent on her husband, divorce did not affect her economic situation and her high social status. Thus, many women were not prepared to put up with incompatible husbands to whom they had been married at age 13 or 14, or even younger. Nor did such women have to tolerate their husband's frequent absences on business travel, spousal abuse, or simply tolerate an unhappy home situation. Refusal to visit the mikvah gave economically independent women a way out of uncongenial marriages, and rabbis had little success, actually we'll go back one, had little success in slowing the numbers of rebellious women, which in fact grew in Germany throughout the 13th century and beyond. Rabbinic authorities accused women of the period of being arrogant, loose, and brazen, but their words had little effect. An example of such a situation appears in a responsum of Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg, the second rabbinic authority, a major figure of the 13th century, in which he addresses the situation of a woman who had returned to her father's home and claiming illness refused to go back to her husband 
and resume marital relations. Her husband demanded that his wife return at once. Rabbi Meir ruled that even if the woman were sick, she must immerse herself in a ritual bath and cohabit with her husband. If she refused to do so, she would be considered a rebellious wife, and if her rebellion persisted for 12 months, her husband would be entitled to divorce her without returning her marriage portion. In this instance, where the wife and her parents appear to have been willing to forfeit her dowry, the woman's refusal to visit the mikvah was likely intended to extricate herself from an unhappy marriage. In a bit of hyperbole, we think, Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, a, the Rosh, a student of Rabbi Meir declared, were they to be allowed to divorce at their own initiative, not a single Jewish woman would remain with her husband. All of them would rebel and get divorced. <laughs> Rabbinic writings from the 12th and 13th centuries attack women, as I've mentioned, as brazen, immodest, and loose, and as arrogant towards their husbands. Uh, as Grossman notes, all of these terms are used by men. He suggests that if we had access to even something of the voices of the women, the picture revealed would certainly be very different. Scholars suggest that the number of divorces in Ashkenaz during these centuries was probably higher than 20% of marriages. And the number of divorces in Germany in later generations especially during the 15th century, was evidently even greater than that at the end of the 13th. Um, Grossman lists about 10 different reasons why uh, divorce was so common. Um, and I'll just mention a few of them. Um, obviously, early age of marriage, husband's frequent absences, perhaps the wife's greater success, economically than the husband. Sometimes impotence um, would be a factor. Sometimes the husband would have converted to Christianity. Um, these are just a few um, of the reasons that he cites. Um, this was a time towards the end of the, in the 14th and early 15th century, of great upheaval in Ashkenaz. Uh, Jews were being expelled from places where they had long lived. Uh, those Jews who lived in Ashkenaz had survived the Black Death of the mid 14th century, which brought terrible consequences of persecution to Jewish community. So one would have to imagine there was enormous, simply, stress within everyday life, which also contributed to familial unhappiness. Um, it also was a time where as Jews were increasingly stressed and being expelled from various parts of Germany, uh, many Jews were choosing to migrate elsewhere, to northern Italy and to Poland, so that many of the divorces in the 15th century appear to have been sought by young women who did not yet have children and who wished to stay with their parents rather than accompany a husband who wished to move to a faraway location in such a time when communication across distance was very difficult, not to mention travel, saying goodbye to one's parents would probably be a final event. And it's interesting that the young women um, felt so strongly that they wished to stay in the familiar um, household setting. It is evident that, as in the Cairo Geniza world, no social stigma attached to a prosperous divorcee who would find plentiful opportunities for remarriage. But I believe that it's important to understand that these expressions of rabbinic frustration against perceived female arrogance were not limited to the behavior of the rebellious wife. From the 11th century through the end of the 13th, women in Ashkenaz increasingly inserted themselves in performing religious rituals for which they were not obligated by halakha, by Jewish law. 
This included reciting blessings for the lulav and the sukkah, participating in the grace after meals, reclining at the Passover Seder, and insisting on a more significant place in synagogue worship. We know in 12th century Germany and northern France, women performed and recited blessings over which they were exempt, such as putting on tefillin and wearing fringed garments. There are strong indications that prominent women whose financial support was often necessary for their communities demanded these privileges. These actions also imply that some women at least resented their exclusion from religious obligations and from community honor and recognition. While it's unclear if there was a general movement among Jewish women or if the sources are reporting on practices restricted to elite circles of learned and wealthy women, it is evident that rabbinic authorities felt powerless to prevent these activities. One example of women's assumption of ritual roles in the public domain was the custom of prominent women serving as a godmother, son dekait, when which entailed holding a son or grandson during the ceremony of circumcision in the synagogue. Rabbi Meir Rotenberg vehemently but unsuccessfully attempted to abolish this practice since he believed that the presence of perfumed and well-dressed and bejeweled women in the synagogue among men was immodest. He wrote, it does not seem a fitting custom to me that it be customary in most places for a woman to sit in the synagogue along with the men and the baby circumcised on her lap. It is not a seemly custom for women to enter all dressed up among the men and before the divine presence. His students were also unable to prevent this phenomenon of godmothers since, as they wrote, no one, who, no one listens, no one takes heed of us. <laughs> and the custom continued into the 15th century. By that time, it appears that rabbinic leaders had succeeded in excluding women from the main synagogue sanctuary. Henceforth, the godmother's role was limited to carrying the infant from his mother to the synagogue entrance where he was handed over to the Sandak, the honored godfather who would hold him during the circumcision ritual. In another example of female assertion, Rabbi Jacob ben Moses Molin, known as the Maharil, uh, was asked why he did not protest against a woman in his town known as Rabbanit Bruna, who always wore a talit katan, a fringed garment. The Maharil answered that even though he considered her behavior brazen and arrogant, he did not reproach her because perhaps she will not listen to me. <laughs> what we see here is that women who were in control of sizable financial resources exerted considerable power and even intimidated rabbinic leaders. Rabbi Meir tried to combat the problem of female-initiated divorce by ruling that a Moredit not only had to give up her ketubah, but all her personal property and the private wealth that she had inherited or acquired, it, or acquired through her business undertakings. This ordinance, which contradicted the halakha, is a clear indication that a major social crisis was underway and that the rabbinic leadership was all but helpless in stopping it. An additional mid-13th century edict attempted to limit divorces initiated by women by stating that approval had to be obtained not only from local rabbinic authority, but from those in other neighboring communities as well. This edict, which remained in place into the 15th century, required that substantial sums of money be paid to all the rabbis involved in the decision. Some husbands of rebellious wives, meanwhile, sought permission from sages like Rabbi Meir of Rotenberg to take a second wife. We find this all often in the response to literature, although without success. 
So um, to recap, Ashkenazic legal authorities vehemently, oppo vehemently opposed the Takana of the Moredit that permitted divorce if a wife insisted her husband was repugnant to her, and they did their best to prevent its use, use in Ashkenaz with growing success over time. These negative attitudes sp spread from Ashkenaz to Spain and then to North Africa. Uh, Rabbi Asher ben Yechio, known as the Roche, left Germany in 1305 for southern France and subsequently Spain. He was among those Ashkenazic authorities who stated vehement objections to the use of the Takana writing, from my arrival to this country, I have prevented them throughout the land of Castile from coercing any man to divorce his wife upon her saying she does not want him. Our teachers, the sages of Ashkenaz in France, go to the furthest extreme to avoid coercing divorce because they agree with Rabbeinu Tom and his main arguments and find it proper to rely on them. Under the growing influence of other Ashkenazic sages who championed the objections of Rabbeinu Tom, the rebellious wife Takana permitting divorce on the grounds of the wife's repugnance was progressively abandoned over time from Christian to Muslim, Muslim regions, although in a protracted process that was not always linear. Nevertheless, by the 16th century, it had pretty much faded from view. However, a wife's ability to initiate a divorce by refusing to visit the mikvah was a different matter, since it was well grounded in halakha. As long as a wife had financial resources and the economic and emotional support and or the economic and emotional support of her family, she was able to dissolve her marriage by depleting her kitubah, whereupon her husband would be compelled to divorce her. In conclusion, for many centuries, the Takana of the Moredet enabled wife-initiated divorce in the Jewish communities of the Muslim world, pretty much as a matter of course, and for several centuries in Christian Europe. While the Takana originated primarily in reaction to extra halakhic circumstances, it had sufficient Talmudic and customary precedent to function within the rabbinic system for almost a thousand years. Taking advantage of this takana, again, as I've said, was mainly possible for those women who had sufficient means in, uh, or who were leaving marriages where the husband had no resources. In Ashkenaz, the situation was complicated by Rabbi Gershom's takana, forbidding a man to divorce his wife against her will and by rabbinic resistance to coerce divorces at the wife's behest. As Ashkenazic society began to deteriorate and dissolve under external political and economic pressures, particularly expulsions and Jewish emigration uh, to other more welcoming areas, and as women's wealth and social clout diminished, their ability and willingness to initiate divorce, even with the uh, mikvah ploy was significantly eroded. In the end, possession and control of wealth was the determining factor in a woman's status and determining her choices, a status quo that does not differ much from our present reality. Thank you. Okay. So, um